students to the National Academy of Sciences where another study of the tape was taking place. Those scientists confirmed Steve Barber's findings and concluded that the sounds on the tape were just noise. But in 2001, a study in a respected British forensic journal found the opposite, that the sounds were indeed four gunshots. So what's actually on this tape? To find out, Forensic Files commissioned its own forensic audio analysis of the recording. In a moment, you'll see the test and learn its surprising results. For years, this recording of a Dallas police radio transmission has been shrouded in mystery and controversy. Some scientific studies say it proves the existence of a second assassin, while others say it's nothing but noise. In an attempt to shed new light on the Dallas tape, Forensic Files commissioned its own test using the most sophisticated technology available. Bob Berkovitz, the retired chairman of Sensometrics, a Boston, Massachusetts audio research firm and a respected forensic audio expert, performed the study. If we're going to find out what happened in 1963, uh, it will be by continuing application of the scientific method to what data we have. Applying that method, Berkowitz began his six-month investigation by reviewing all of the earlier acoustic studies and their conclusions. Berkowitz used the same copy studied by the National Academy of Sciences 20 years ago, a copy that hadn't been touched since. First, I located the places that were said to be gunshots. The uh, sound waves were further examined using several programs. One that simply displays the sound wave pattern in great detail. Another uh, software that we've developed mainly for speech study uh, that displays spectrograms. Almost immediately, Berkowitz found a problem. When we look at these shots, they're very different from each other. This is shot number one, for example. This is shot number two. Now we'll go to shot number three. Looked nothing like each other. So that if one of them looked like a gunshot, we would have to conclude the other two didn't. Next, he performed a spectrographic analysis of what were assumed to be the engine sounds of the motorcycle moving along the motorcade. And he noticed something peculiar. What you see on the screen going from left to right is a wide gray band, and that represents the noise. Within this band are two darker stripes that stay in the same place from left to right throughout the noise. This shows that the noise isn't changing in any significant way during this time, and you'd expect the noise to change if it were made by a motorcycle that was moving. So Berkowitz concluded that the motorcycle wasn't even in the presidential motorcade. Finally, Berkowitz tackled the most important question of all. Are these gunshots on the motorcycle tape? This is the acoustic fingerprint of a grassy knoll gunshot, the result of calculations made by government scientists in 1978. This is the muzzle blast, followed by echoes. This is the waveform of what's recorded on the motorcycle tape. When government scientists compared these two, they found 14 possible echoes on the motorcycle tape. 10 matched the echoes on the grassy knoll fingerprint. 10 echoes matching out of 14 was a pretty high percentage and explains why government scientists concluded the sound on the motorcycle tape was a grassy knoll gunshot. Berkowitz decided to do the same comparison, only this time he did it a bit differently. 
If we uh, use the procedure described uh, by the original investigators of printing out a picture of the waveform on a long roll of paper and then measuring it visually and deciding which impulses to include and which not and which to count, there might be a chance of human error. Berkovitz designed a computer program to compare these two waveforms eliminating both human error and the possibility of subjectivity. The computer program looks one by one for each of the echoes that are said to have occurred after the gunshot was fired to see if there is an impulse that matches within a thousandth of a second. The computer also took into account such variables as the speed of the Dictabelt recording. The computer identified twice the number of possible echoes on the motorcycle tape. And only five of those matched the acoustic fingerprint. With five matches out of a possible 25, Berkovitz says it's highly unlikely this is a gunshot. We were unable to find any evidence that in fact there is a gunshot in the recording. Berkovitz then increased the latitude by which the computer calculates a match by lowering the level of what could be considered an echo and adjusting the estimated speed of the motorcycle tape. Even this didn't improve the odds of a gunshot. Then Berkovitz asked a more basic question. If the sounds weren't gunshots, what were they? First, he had the computer generate random noise. Then, he selected three different portions of the random noise and compared them to the acoustic fingerprint. I found that the numbers were not that different and in some cases were better than the uh, correlation and probabilities obtained with the uh, police recording. Therefore, the impulses can't be uh, the gunfire of assassins. And Berkovitz's tests also confirmed what Steve Barber found years earlier, that the sheriff's message, hold everything secure, was recorded on the motorcycle channel at the time the sheriff said it, not by any other means or methods. Scientific proof that the audio tape argued about and studied by numerous government panels and independent researchers for 25 years wasn't even recorded at the time of the assassination. I hope that what we've done and talked about today will bring us a little closer to the truth. And uh, it too is open for criticism and discussion, which is as it should be. Questions answered and questions that remain when the JFK assassination investigation reopened, returns. The echoes of gunfire that day in Dealey Plaza have resonated through every town, large and small, in the 40 years since the assassination. The question everyone asks, did Lee Harvey Oswald murder John F. Kennedy, and did he do it alone? We may never know everything about the assassination, but there are some things we can say with certainty. If there was an elusive grassy knoll shooter, he not only missed his target, but left not one shred of scientific evidence behind. Over the past 40 years, numerous forensic investigations, including this one, have concluded the Warren Commission was correct. Oswald acted alone. But the search for answers will inevitably continue. I don't know what happened. I've studied this for the last 40 years, and I don't know what happened. What happened to President Kennedy was not a conspiracy of bad people trying to hide whoever really killed the president, but a conspiracy of ignorant people who didn't know how to properly do an autopsy 
and to provide information to the investigators. It is a scandal of the first order that the President of the United States, when he was assassinated, did not get the same forensic uh, autopsy that you or I would get if we were shot in any major city. I think belief in conspiracy is just another way of articulating uncertainty. There's something dark out there. I don't know what it is, but it must be something. But most people just weren't prepared to accept this really dreadful thought that this schnook, this nobody, could climb up some stairs and kill John F. Kennedy. That was hard to believe. <laughs>